That's me, Kim Surtich, another victim of the Affordable Care Act. My rate's increasing 20%, 25%, more than 100% year after year, insurance plan cancellation after cancellation, endlessly writing letters to Congress, and invite to the White House to talk about it with the President, meeting with congressional staff, countless media interviews. Yet, I was getting nowhere. Nothing was changing, rates were still going up, no one was listening. Then it dawned on me, I didn't need insurance. Insurance needed me. I'm healthy, not a consumer of health care, and paying the full premium rates. No one cared what I was paying because they needed my money. So I dropped my insurance and discovered the freedom of being a cash pay patient. But I wanted to find out if this was an option for others who can't afford insurance or who simply don't want to pay for it. And I really wanted to understand how we even got here. I sought out some policy experts who were more than willing to tell me. Carriers like Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas City, who has been offering plans since the early 1950s, no longer offers private health insurance plans. In my state, you could buy, if you're in your 20s, you could buy a health insurance very good health insurance, you know, wide coverage, um, extensive drug coverage, covered everything for about $90 a month. Now it's three or $400 a month. Most people are healthy and they don't think that. You know, we talk in America like all these people are sick. Reality is 75% of Americans never spend more than $500 on health care. So they don't even know where they're card is for their uh, insurance plan, nor what their deductible is, their out-of-pocket, because they don't use it. One of the reasons Obamacare has had such a disastrous effect on the individual market is because it forced insurers to issue policies to anybody, the states who were running these high-risk pools said, oh, well, we're not going to pay this money anymore. And they closed down their high-risk pools, and all of the people with pre-existing conditions were back in the individual market. And so premiums rose enormously for um, the individuals who weren't ill and had been buying their insurance all along. One of the biggest drivers of rising costs in the individual market were the mandates that were placed in Obamacare. All of these mandates, you know, when you look at them, they all sound nice and compassionate, but when you add the prices of all of them up, if it drives the cost up to the point where a family can't afford it anymore, then are you really helping people get health insurance coverage? One of the big problems with Obamacare is we got rid of medical underwriting and destroyed the uh, health systems that were taking care of the really sick people. People can't afford what we have out there now. Because all plans were affected by the ACA, you have few choices. You may have a couple of plans from this carrier. I know one carrier offering one plan. This carrier may have three or four plans. They are all going to be expensive. They're all going to have very high deductibles. They will have skinny networks. You can only go to this oncologist. You can only go to these three hospitals. If you're already sick, you're not buying insurance. What you're buying is somebody else coming in and paying part of your health care costs. That's not insurance. Not the same as somebody who's healthy going to the insurance company saying, I'm healthy, who knows, I might get sick, a whole bunch of people might get sick. What are you going to charge me for taking that risk? We see people who are saying, I'm not even going to do insurance. I'm just going to go with my direct pay physician. I'm going to go to my concierge doctor, get all my basic stuff covered. If you can't afford it, you can't afford it. Why is the federal government involved in private plans at all? My health insurance story began in 2013, when a few months before the Affordable Care Act went into effect, my health insurance plan was canceled. I honestly didn't see that coming because I was promised it wouldn't happen. If you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor, period. If you like your health care plan, you will be able to keep your health care plan, period. So I signed up for a new plan, and then in 2015, that company got out of the market and my plan was canceled again. Fine, I decided I'll get a new plan. And this time, I had to get a new doctor. And then, six months later, I got a letter from that company saying they were also getting out of the Arizona marketplace and my plan would be canceled. At that point, I gave up and I opted out of health insurance. 
I always knew the ACA wasn't going to work for entrepreneurs like myself, people who buy their health insurance on the individual market. As a former reporter, when I read stories about the ACA, I always had more questions than I got answers. As all of this was unfolding, I did not sit quietly by. I wrote and I wrote and I wrote to my congresswoman, my senators, reporters and producers. I posted my story on social media. I posted it to the independent women's voice. And it seemed like all of that effort had finally paid off when the White House called. They wanted me to tell my story to the president. I lost my plan three times during the, the Obamacare era. Um, after losing it this year, I decided to opt out. So right now, I do not have traditional health care. And I was went from a $365 a month um, premium last year to a $809 premium this year. And a higher deductible. The deductible was going to be $6,800, no co-pays. So if I went to the doctor, I would be paying out of my pocket. And it just didn't seem like a good use of my money. I felt like I would be a better steward of that $17,000 at the end of the year should I have reached my deductible and just decided to opt out. I went into a faith-based share program. And I've had individual insurance for 25 years, since I started my business. So I've always been in that individual market. I've always done what was right. I took responsibility for myself, made sure I was covered for healthcare because I'm a business person. I don't want any you know, huge um, healthcare expenses to affect money that could be going to my business now having to go to a health expense. So I was in my mid-20s when I said, you know what, I've got to get, we've always got to get square with this. I have to have in, in insurance, so I have. Well, thank you very Until much. Until this year. The people of Arizona have been hit very, very hard, at least 116%. Here's the bad news. It's going to go up more this year. The bad news? It's all bad news. 35 million Americans do not have health insurance, with nearly half of them saying it's because the cost is too high. 50% of businesses with less than 50 employees do not offer health insurance to the workers. Again, because it's just too expensive. And even those who do have health insurance through an employer are getting hit with skyrocketing premiums, deductibles, and co-pays. This has been going on for years, and it keeps getting worse. And we keep putting up with it, acting like there's no choice. But there are other health care options. Health sharing ministries, direct primary care doctors, cash pay surgery centers, health fairs, and compounding pharmacies. I knew I had to find other solutions for my own health care. But first, I sat down with Dr. Keith Smith to better understand the hold insurance companies and hospitals have on us as a society and how they aren't working in the patient's best interest. The giant hospital bill is, is a, real, a real good place to start to understand how the scam of healthcare works in the United States. The giant hospital bill creates a lot of fear that really serves the interests of the big insurance companies because if you are truly uncertain about being bankrupted just because you have a hernia, you're more inclined to buy an insurance product or service that you otherwise would not buy because you don't see it as a value. There's one more truly nefarious purpose that a giant hospital bill serves where an insurance company with a $100,000 bill from a hospital can ride into an employer group on their white horse and say, you know, we've discounted this down to 20,000, so we've saved you 80,000, when the hospital really probably only had about three or 4,000 of expense, so they really made money. But the insurance companies charge employer groups to the extent that they achieve these discounts, many times a commission up to 33%. So if you think through the perverse incentives, an insurance company would rather start with a $200,000 bill because then the commission they earn on this fictitious savings is that much larger. So the giant hospital bill uh, performs many functions. None of them are any good for the patients. They're very good for the insiders and the cronies in the industry. Hospitals claim that they lose a lot of money many times to just maintain the fiction of their not-for-profit status. 
Hospitals also get a kickback from the federal government based on the extent to which they claim these losses. And I call it the reverse Enron, where Enron made more money by exaggerating their, their winnings, and the hospitals actually make more money by exaggerating their losses. And this, this is called the uncompensated care. It's very Orwellian name. You would think uncompensated care means care for which you're not compensated, but it's actually a revenue item uh, to the not-for-profit hospitals here in the United States. Hospitals are wasteful and because they typically are paid for being wasteful. The traditional payment to a hospital from an insurance carrier is based on the amount of supplies used uh, or the amount of time in the operating room or the recovery room. It's true, we are scared into buying health insurance. With hospitals billing patients amounts exceeding what the insurance companies will pay, and with the federal government actually paying hospitals billions of dollars a year for uncompensated care, who are we actually supposed to trust? I'd like to think we can still trust our doctors, but it's getting harder and harder for them to do their jobs. Dr. Manny Sethi and Dr. Zudi Jasser, who have both testified before Congress, aren't shy about expressing their concern for the patients who are the ones stuck in the middle. I got invited to testify before the Senate. When I went up there, I was just surprised at the level of pushback by some folks and it just led me to believe that either A, you just simply don't care, or B, you're very disconnected from folks, and either of those two are not good excuses. We are the most vulnerable in our small businesses in the healthcare network system. Why? Because the big institutions have their board of directors, their positions on Wall Street, and their lobbyists in Washington caring for the health of their institutions. The health of my small business institution, other than the SBA, uh, has no representation. And if you talk to most Congress people, they will tell you they listen to the lobbyists and who came to their last town hall, which is usually the activists in their community. It's not the doctors who are really getting pulled from every end and don't have time to really even talk to our members of Congress, let alone lobby them to understand what legislation is before their desk. I think that over time, the answer that why we have reached this conundrum is that you have a bunch of career politicians who know nothing about healthcare making these pivotal decisions and they're completely out of touch with people. You have all these insurance companies and these lobbyists talking to these congressmen and these senators and those are the people they're hearing from. They're not hearing from Joe, the trucker who I met in East Tennessee and about the problems that he's facing. We have let them take control and make decisions about things like healthcare when they have no business doing that and that we needed to be at that table advocating for our patients. Especially though in the last five, six, seven, eight years with Obamacare, I've seen a huge decrease in choice for patients. It has not necessarily been the doctors, it's been their insurance. So as a result of their decrease in choice of insurance, they used to come to me with 25 plans and say, which ones do you think is better? Now they're coming to me with two plans and they say, which one of these two do you think I can choose? Or if they're on the exchange, there's one plan in which I am struggling to get, make sure I stay on that plan so I don't lose those patients and I still want to take care of them. And basically there's no more choice in it and we just sort of take what we can get. And as a result, I think the quality of care that we give is significantly limited. We got to change healthcare right now. It's not working with premiums rising 44%, you know, 130% over five years, just, you know, these insane numbers. I do not know how someone could not look at this and say something has to change. I don't tell them like some HMOs, you have two problems today and if you have a third problem you need to come back in a week or, or two weeks. I know that would make me probably more efficient, um, but it doesn't create good relationships. Uh, so that's not why I went into medicine and if government's going to pay for health care, then they should be telling patients what they eat, what they don't eat, whether they wear helmets or not. A Wall Street Journal article called it the screen time doctor, which is you go in to see your doctor and your doctor's not looking at you in your eye. The doctor spends 90% of the time on the screen listening, maybe partially listening while he's hitting all the check boxes in order to get the incentives paid so that the insurance company can figure out whether you are making your patients higher quality healthy than not. So rather than the patient judging quality, 
the insurance companies say, oh, patients can't judge quality like they do every other industry. No, we have to judge it based on the data that the doctors who are sitting behind desks figure out instead of those of us sitting by the bedsides. So what's the solution? And who is that solution for? Unless you have a real sweet deal with your employer, everyone wants lower health care costs. Let's start with how to cover the big ticket items if you don't have health insurance. One way to lower costs is to get rid of the middlemen, health insurance companies and the government. Such an option exists with health sharing ministries. There's a faith component to this concept. Health sharing ministries revolve around a community of people with common religious or ethical beliefs who share their medical costs. Medical cost sharing has been practiced for decades by the Amish Mennonites and the concept spread to other communities in the early 1980s. They are uncomplicated and effective at covering medical costs at affordable monthly rates with reasonable deductibles. Liberty HealthShare is a nationwide nonprofit networking of men, women, and families who come together around a common cause, uh, and that's paying each other's medical bills. Uh, and we do that in the context of a shared community of values and beliefs without the aid of an insurance company or the government, just a regular systematic way of meeting healthcare costs. Out of convenience, we give our members an ID card. They present the ID card at the doctor's office or the hospital uh, that just simply explains that we're a healthcare sharing ministry and where to send the bill. That bill comes to us and we process it on behalf of that member and then that bill shows up in the individual member's online account. So they see Dr. Smith billed X, it was reduced by Y because we make adjustments to that billing based upon a fair and reasonable scale that we tap into. Uh, then we ask a sufficient number of members to help pay that bill. We send the check directly from the member's account directly to the doctor or to the hospital. It is a non-insurance approach to healthcare where we have 70,000 families, over 250,000 people, sharing one another's burdens to the tune of over $25 million a month. And so every month, our members get the opportunity to share in a specific need for another family. And they get to bear not just the financial need, of that family, but the emotion and spiritual need as well. They send a note or a card along to encourage the family and they're praying for those families together and they do this at a fraction of the cost of health insurance. We have to draw a line of, uh, of dependability uh, that says th this is a fair and reasonable basis on which to evaluate the service in a, in a hospital. We use Medicare. Everyone's familiar with it. Many hospitals, doctors can't survive, frankly, on Medicare reimbursements. Uh, but it gives us a baseline for evaluating every aspect of medical service and what the Medicare reimbursement would be. Then we simply add, for fairness and honorability, we add 50% to that for a doctor, 60% for a hospital. We have a 97% acceptance rate from doctors and hospitals for that reimbursement schedule. The other 3%, we just pick up the phone and, and discuss it and negotiate it and, and resolve it. These ministries are now sharing annually on the order of $800 million a year, but that is rapidly growing, rapidly growing. A year from now, it could be a billion dollars. It's about a million people today in America are doing medical sharing. So we represent uh, the most rapidly growing sector in the individual market. And one of the great things about Samaritan Ministries or any healthcare sharing option is that we're not bound by the open enrollment date. So you can join any day of the year, you know, 365 days a year, you can get on our website and you can sign up and join Samaritan Ministries. We have seen a significant uptick in growth since the Affordable Care Act that was passed, mostly because of just the additional pressure there is on families to choose something. You know, families who are going without insurance because they didn't want to subsidize abortion are choosing things like Samaritan Ministries to be able to participate in a healthcare option that's consistent with their religious values. There's still, though, people that we meet every day that have never heard of healthcare sharing or Samaritan Ministries that, how do I not know about this? And well, it's just, you have to travel in the right circles. It is a mindset change. It's a, it's a paradigm shift. There's no doubt about it because it's based upon voluntary cooperation in a community of mutual aid and mutual assistance. Now that's contrary to what we've been taught for decades and generations maybe uh, as to how you meet healthcare costs through insurance. 
We're not insurance. We don't want to be insurance. But our members are really in control of that picture. The members get to choose the hospital. The members get to choose the provider that they're going with. And so we want to make sure that we do everything to reduce friction around their health care services as much as possible. And hopefully we'll find doctors and hospitals that are looking to find patients that are engaged around their care and just looking for a fair price. I think a very attractive option for people in the individual market, uh, Christian, small businessmen, uh, maybe somebody who owns a dry cleaning business or a restaurant, um, is to go over to medical sharing. The sharing option, in my opinion, is becoming more and more attractive for people because it's reduced costs, less regulation, and in my opinion, if you are a Christian, it suits the Christian lifestyle better. It's really those, number one, who want to take responsibility for the care of their health. Uh, that really uh, are offended, frankly, as I am, <laughs> with the government intrusion and requiring and mandates on the use of our money in ways that violate our conscience, in many cases. The third is that they really want to participate in a caring community, where the motivation really is initially to give. Our desire is to assist and care for one another. The health sharing ministry's concept is contrary to how we've been made to believe medical expenses should be taken care of. And yet, it works for millions of people, like some members I had a chance to speak to, including Chris. Chris's teenage daughter suffered a brain hemorrhage requiring two emergency surgeries, and it came with six-figure hospital bills. Chris sat down with me to share the story. She couldn't stand up, and I tried to pick her up, and was like, oh my god. And so finally, she said, well, maybe I can crawl. So I set her on the ground and she's like, she can't even crawl. Her whole left side's just paralyzed. So then that's when it finally hit me. It's like, oh no, this is not, this is no migraine. So I carry her into the car, drive her to the ER. So they scan her brain and they find the, the bleed. And so the doctor comes back and says, um, you know, we found a, a little, a, a small bleed in her brain. You can see the bleed. And I'm like, that's when my world just came crashing down. I was just like, just total shock. So she had a, a catheter surgery where they come up through the, the art, major artery of the, the femoral artery there, and they come up into the brain, and they guide it with a machine, and actually put glue, some sort of medical glue, in the, the artery that was causing the bleed and, and stop the bleed at that point. And then they elected to do a craniotomy where they actually opened up the skull and drained off uh, the excess blood. And so they had basically two surgeries in one evening. And they're just like, holy cow, you know, this is, is this even real, you know? So it was, it was the worst thing that ever happened in my life. When the hospital bills started to come in, um, I wasn't sure. I mean, I was like, the, the hospital kind of scared us in terms of what was actually gonna get paid and what was not. And I was just waiting for the big bills. You know, you have this, the neurosurgery and the, the you know, the hospital stays and the ICU and the stuff that's gonna be very, very expensive. And um, I was just gonna, I was just like biting my nails waiting to see what would happen when those bills came in and they came in uh, some of the biggest bills were six figures. The biggest bill was actually paid to, for Phoenix Children's Hospital, a six-figure bill. Um, then I'm like, oh my God, this is for real. This is, these guys are for real. Yeah. So just like any insurance company does, uh, that's kind of the game that's played. The hospital will bill significantly more. The, some of the bigger bills were negotiated down 80% probably. I had so much gratitude to, towards Liberty and everything they'd done for the family. It's just, I gotta get back, you know, this, this, this place, this is a, such a better option than traditional insurance for this type of situation. Um, and I want to give back any way I can. Well, when I looked into Obamacare uh, six years ago, when it first came out, my premiums were going to be like uh, 1000 to $1,100 a month. And it was going to be like uh, ten to $11,000 deductible before they would actually pay. So just on my premium, I'm saving like $700 a month. I was not going to pay those rates on Obamacare. I would have. Uh, I, I've always been healthy. Uh, my wife is healthy. Uh, we've never had any bills that would have even reached the premiums that I would have uh, paid on Obamacare. So I would. I would have taken the risk at, at, and just paid the penalty. I, and I was looking for options. I was looking for catastrophic uh, uh, health care to help out in case I did have a huge event. Uh, but uh, you weren't able to buy that. So I started looking into alternatives, and uh, one of the alternatives was uh, Liberty HealthShare, Christian HealthShare sharing accounts. 
The premiums, which started out at $299 a month at that time, are still $299 a month, six, seven years later. You know, I was wondering what would ever happen if I had an event, and uh, I found out. I had a, an eye operation two years ago. I gave them my Liberty Health Share card. They accepted it. They called in and got an approval on the uh, procedure. And after our deductible, they paid 100% above that amount. It was the same when I went into the hospital just recently. I had my gallbladder out. The uh, hospital accepted my card. Even though it was an emergency, they called in within an hour. They said, you're approved. Uh, after your deductible, they're going to cover 100%. And uh, I can watch as they reprice them from what the hospital charged, and then they, they put that they're shared. And everyone that's been taken care of so far has been shared of that event. So, and it, it came to approximately $120,000 which cost me 688 bucks. We decided to start researching the Christian Healthcare Ministries, the sharing programs. To be members of the Christian Healthcare Ministries, to cover myself and the three kids, we pay $300 a month. The difference I feel about my healthcare being able to be covered by the Christian Healthcare Ministries versus traditional insurance is, I feel a sense of relief. I don't feel a concern when, I, when any of us have an incident where we need to go to a hospital or have a procedure done that we're going to go into debt. The biggest relief for me is that if somebody in my family is sick and has to acquire emergency room care, I don't second guess taking my children if they were to be hurt badly, whether I'm gonna save money or I'm gonna save their life. Something really important to me about this whole program, the Christian Healthcare Ministries and the sharing programs, is that the money that we send them every month, we know that it is actually going to someone's need. It's going to fill a medical bill for another person that is struggling with an illness or a disease. It's also lifting a burden off of their shoulders to know that they have people coming alongside them in prayer and encouragement. They actually send a card to us every month that gives us a name, an address, an email, um, a phone number to send expressions of encouragement and prayer. And so you know that when you're really coming alongside your brothers and sisters to be able to pray for them and, and help carry that burden with them, it's, it's a feeling of joy. Our, our bill will never be more than $500, no matter, no matter what happens for, for the year. I feel the choice that we made to go from traditional insurance to the Christian Healthcare Ministries was a blessing. It was a feeling of relief because we knew that we weren't going to have a $20,000 medical bill. That would never happen. If we ha had all the money in the world and uh, were offered the traditional insurance again, I would not go back. People can be skeptical about healthcare sharing. They look at the price and they say, how is this possible? How is this not too good to be true? And once they've seen how this works or once they've talked to a family who's had a personal experience, usually those blinders are able to come off. They're able to see, hey, this does work. This is better. It works like healthcare used to work long before the government and the insurance companies started to make things more complicated. It's very simple. I go to the doctor that I want to go to. And when the burden is too big for me to bear on my own, I have family and friends that are surrounding me with help so that I can meet that burden with the help of community. So the first reaction is skepticism. Once they see it and participate in it and, and experience it, it is a level of enthusiasm that's hard to register because we are freedom from the insurance model and insurance system. And, it get, and those of us who've done this wouldn't do it any other way. People are mostly bound into their employer provided plans. People don't know that there's choice around healthcare. And so finding a healthcare choice that's consistent for you may be a matter of just taking off some of your blinders and looking around to see what else is available besides what your employer is offering for you. Health sharing plans are very difficult to place in that there's a big educational curve when you're dealing with this particular product. It is not insurance. They have to understand the concept of it. It's a very good financial tool to offset not having health insurance, it's a difficult leap of faith given their understanding of the insurance world. What's really interesting in, in, in sharing is there are members of the House of Representatives who are enrolled in healthcare sharing ministries. And there are many, many members, some of whom have been 
members for years and years and years in state legislatures. We're voluntary, we're cooperative, and we're motivated based upon our spiritual values and beliefs. It says God's really placed us here on earth to use our time and energy and resources to help another person whenever they're in need. We simply turn that principle into a solution for health care. So I think the biggest factor uh, causing the growth in the health care sharing movement is, is the cost in the individual market using traditional insurance. It's just gotten prohibitively expensive. But the other thing that's a major driver in a lot of people joining these ministries is the shared community sense of it. And for a lot of these Christian families, it's, it's very comforting for them to know that they're engaged with a Christian ministry. Their dollars are going to another person who has a medical bill, a medical expense. Their dollars are being literally invested in the life of another individual. It's not going to a company black hole somewhere. That produces such a sense of satisfaction and, and a feeling of, of engagement with others. That's the number one reason why it's so gratifying and they spread the word. I think we have a more efficient, more compassionate, uh, more caring way of helping people deal with the costs of their health care. We're not insurance. We are, in my opinion, better than insurance. And it's just a grassroots movement of individuals taking responsibility for the care of their health and the costs associated with that care, but then sharing it in community with one another. What about the day-to-day -day medical needs? Whether you're a member of a health sharing ministry, have a traditional form of insurance, or have nothing at all, you can benefit from being a cash pay patient, where you can go to any doctor or hospital you want. You aren't limited by insurance networks. And there are many cash pay friendly doctors. A quick search of the internet to find a doctor for myself led me to join the wedge.com and the direct primary care concept. These doctors do not take insurance of any kind. Instead, they charge a reasonable monthly fee to their patients, who then have access to them 24-7 with no co-pays. Patients can get prescription drugs at wholesale costs, and many procedures are done on-site with little or no additional fees. What direct primary care does is people pay uh, usually $80 to $90 a month for the year contract, and then depending on how the practice does it, you have virtually unlimited time with your physician as you need it. And the physicians and the patients who do this say that it helps keep people in better health because people's questions get answered, the physician knows them intimately, he can make better recommendations, and he can keep them out of the hospital. And they've been fascinating because they're starting to stock the kinds of medicines that their heart patients and diabetics need and sell them for not very much. And they're making agreements with people who have imaging systems for discount prices on imaging. So who knows where this kind of innovation is going to go? We encourage our members to really connect with direct primary care physicians where they're paying a monthly access fee uh, and, and on the basis of that relationship really using that physician and their skills and abilities uh, as a health advisor. They're not just seeing them because they're sick, they're seeing them to maintain and increase and enhance their health. That's key. I go to a cash practice doctor, a direct pay independent practice doctor, even though I'm on Medicare. Why do I do that? Because of the doctor-patient relationship. This man knows me intimately. He doesn't sit at his desk with a computer terminal. He doesn't have a scribe in the room taking notes. He stares at me and concentrates and gives me good advice. And he's more than willing to do that because he's not bogged down with all kinds of overhead. He has a part-time clerk in the office. He doesn't have to have people to file codes and all these other things. Uh, and file cabinets full of paper. Um, he just takes care of his patients. It's direct pay by the individual. The doctor's got skin in the game. The patient's got skin in the game because the patient is paying. The doctor's success depends on satisfying the patient. Doctors Kirby Farnsworth and Kendrick Johnson left their traditional practices to open a direct primary care clinic out of the frustration that their patients weren't getting the care they deserved. The question is, how many patients can we take care of 
in the way that they're supposed to be taken care of? And then how little can we charge for that care? So it's a membership based model where we charge the minimum amount possible in order to give good care to our patients. And that includes with the membership a direct line to your doctor basically where you can get a hold of your doctor 24 seven and it includes all of your visits and any procedures we can do in the clinic and it also includes any diagnostic tests that we do in the office like EKGs and urine tests and then labs and imaging and medications we can give to people at wholesale prices and so people get more access to a doctor, they don't have to deal with insurance companies, and they save money. So when a new patient comes in, uh, their initial reaction, almost without fail, is what's the catch? Uh, they, they always say there's got to be something that I'm missing, there's got to be something that, that, that I don't fully understand. And the reason is, is because they're used to an, an insurance-based model that has a copay or has an associated seven-minute encounter with uh, five follow-ups with more copays and more lab tests and more uh, unwritten or unseen bills and unseen charges that, that nobody knows about. And, and very, very rewarding to, to tell people ultimately there is no other catch to this type of a subscription-based model and most new patients are kind of left dumbfounded a little bit, like, that's it, we're done. You've done everything I've asked you to do. You spend an hour with me. I don't have to pay you anything extra aside from the membership. I don't have to do anything else. And here's my medicine, and here's my lab test that we do in our office. And they usually leave with a smile. Well, is, is this way of practicing more true to the Hippocratic Oath? When we talk about first doing no harm, that should also include do no financial harm also means that we do no harm emotionally and physically. So helping patients to get access to care by lowering the financial barriers to it, as well as decreasing the stress around finances, that does a lot for people's health. So when patients join our practice, uh, we would like to sit down with them initially. It's usually an hour consultation to begin, just to specify and, and help understand what our expectations are of them and what they can expect of us. Our goal for our patients is to understand the power of prevention. And we really want our patients to prevent disease rather than react to their disease and throw band-aids and pills and medications at their disease. On our end, we commit to same day or next day appointments if urgent. We commit to being available 24-7. Uh, via electronic means. And we also uh, really commit to our patients to spending time with them to address all of their concerns. But we're trained to take care of roughly 75 to 80 percent of all healthcare needs. And if we can do that in this office, then we really can limit the, the extra urgent care visits and emergency room visits and even unnecessary specialty visits. Direct primary care is a very exciting and innovative way uh, to deliver health care, uh, it's been shown that it can reduce costs um, and it gets a better quality of care to the patients because they have better access to their primary care provider. I've always been passionate about preventing disease and about really showing compassion for my patients. When I wanted to talk about exercise and nutrition and sleep, I was taking a whole lot of time with each patient that wasn't built into the, the schedule for that day. According to my boss, I was spending too much time with patients. So honestly, I was kind of desperate to find some other way to practice medicine. I was either going to have to stop doing what I thought was most important for the patient, or I was going to have to find a new model to do it. The traditional path is to go sign into a corporate contract with guaranteed revenue and guaranteed salary. Uh, in a direct primary care practice, that's the exact kind of polar opposite. Literally, the, the first day that I started this, uh, this practice, it, it did not take but a half hour be before I knew that this was the right thing for me to do. Um, when you're, you're really reduced your overhead, you've really cut out the, the middleman, you really start to understand how it's a direct relationship between me and my patients. And that's a valuable tool and it's very, very rewarding. We're not going to try and make money on anything uh, besides the membership that the patients give us. So anything else that might cost the patient money 
our goal is to just break even on. So when it comes to things that are very small costs, like EKG pads only cost us 39 cents. So that's just included in the membership. So you get an EKG for free here. The only things that, that we actually charge for here in the office are things that patients walk away with, like a cast. We draw the labs here in the clinic, but we're not actually processing the labs. So the, the lab company has their costs and we just try and cover our costs to the lab. So if you have concerns of a strep throat, you can come in, we can swab you with no extra charge. If it's positive, we can treat you for $1.36. There are some things that are outside of our control that we have to send out to other companies, lab work or imaging or, or pathology studies. And we've spent a lot of work into establishing contracts and arrangements with companies to offer very, very affordable pricing. X-rays in our local area are between $30 and $35 per X-ray. CT scans run about $300. MRIs between $275 and $350. And lab work by itself, panels of cholesterol medicine, lipid panels, uh, diabetes checks, kidney checks, can be comfortably taken care of for less than $30. We found that most emergency room visits are not emergent. And we like to provide that service in our, our office that we're able to take care of those urgent and semi-urgent and, and even some emergent needs in our office that saves our patients thousands and thousands of dollars. My father brought a young girl in who he thought the arm might be broken. So we met and in the evening at the office and I took a look at the arm and was able to find out that it was just out of place and was able to pop it back into place. Family went home without having to go to the emergency room or have any, any ER visit costs. There was a six-year-old little boy whose arm was broken when he came in. So we sent him for an x-ray. The x-ray only cost $25. So we found out it was broken. Then I casted it here in clinic and the cast only cost $25. So instead of uh, maybe a couple thousand dollars for an emergency room visit plus multiple follow-up visits with a specialist, he was able to get his whole fracture management package for 50 bucks. And we've chosen as a membership-based model to really mitigate and really take care of the most, the bulk of these needs so that we don't file insurance claims in our office ever. There are roughly 1,500 DPC, direct primary care doctors in the, in the country. Direct primary care is uh, fantastic at containing healthcare costs. Our overhead is drastically reduced, and so we're able to offer those costs, those savings to our patients. Uh, the other kind of components to that is, is the medications, the wholesale dispensed uh, generic medications that we can save our patients up to 60 to 90% of their, of their healthcare costs for those prescriptions. There's about 46 states in the country that allow physician dispensing, and that really allows us as providers to offer medications, whether it be generic, wholesale, uh, antibiotics, uh, blood pressure medicine, diabetes medicine, any maintenance, cholesterol medicine, and a lot of even the, the specialty medications at really steep discounts. Uh, we have wholesale distributors that are all throughout the country, and they've offered us uh, uh, fantastic rates. We've had many patients that have literally saved the, the membership cost in their medications alone. There really is a huge difference in how traditional based practices and direct primary care facilities operate. And those differences revolve around keeping up with the requirements and demands dictated by the insurance companies. I've got 17 employees in a practice with three and a half providers. That is not the way my father was practicing medicine in the 60s and 70s. And what I've done now is I went from a just a small office type office manager to I have a practice administrator who is qualified to run a practice of 35, 40 doctors, you know, but that's the type of person I had to get in order for her to navigate all of the different plans and help me obtain the incentives. In a conventional insurance based practice, you need four people to do the billing and work with the insurance companies. You need three people to room the patients to get them in and out quickly so you can see lots of patients in a day. You need a couple people answering the phones. And we usually only just have one staff member here to take care of all those things because there's fewer patients 
and there's no billing, co you know, billing administrative duties outside of just checking to make sure that the, the patient's credit card went through on a monthly basis. Most standard family practice clinics run about 2,500 to 3,000 patients. So we had to backtrack and say, all right, how many people can this clinic fit for us to take care of all their chronic management, their acute management, any type of other prevention? And those numbers are, are pretty well supported that between five to 800 patients per provider is the magic number. There is no wait time in our waiting room. Um, we schedule our patients an hour at a time and we expect patients to be there right on time because they don't have to wait. They're going to get in right at their appointment time. We have patients who have all kinds of different insurance situations, some with great insurance plans and some with none, and we don't bill the insurance at all. So we just have a, a relationship directly with the patient. Some of our patients have just regular insurance and they come to us for a couple of reasons. One is that they have found that they can't get care like ours anywhere else. They can't find a doctor who has the time to spend 45 minutes with them if they need that or an hour with them if they need that. They can write us an email or send us a text message or call us. They might also find that they're saving money in the long run on labs, medication, uh, co-pays. Then we have patients who have have high deductible catastrophic plans that are going to be paying out of pocket for their care anyway and they find that they get their care a lot less expensively from us. And then there's also a segment of our population that doesn't have any insurance. They have just not been able to afford insurance. They come and get uh, their primary care from us and we try and help them to find some kind of, of coverage for their catastrophic needs because we're not going to be able to take care of a hospitalization or a surgery for them. So many of our patients also have these health sharing plans. They are similar to insurance and in that they cover the the risk of having some catastrophic problem, and, uh, and yet they're a lot less expensive. People who have come to us not having been able to afford insurance for years, and not even seeing a doctor for five, 10 years, and then they find out about our practice and figure out that they can see a doctor, not only for a, a low price, but also get this this uh, kind of care that, that they haven't seen before where they can spend 45 minutes with a doctor on their first visit. I had a patient that walked in that had some history of gestational diabetes. It had been two plus years since she'd been able to go see a doctor and we really wanted to hone in on what she's in, what her intake is, what her diet, her nutrition, what her exercise status is. Understanding what she's actually eating is one of the huge factors that we don't have uh, time for in a traditional insurance-based model, and it usually diverts to a referral to a dietitian in combination with a nutritionist, in combination with an endocrinologist, and we were able to sit down for, for nearly an hour and just go through, as she was shopping virtually in, in the shopping market, to see what things she normally purchases and why those are bad choices and why those are going to be harmful to her potential for developing diabetes and really understand her perspective. Patients who are in tears sometimes, realizing that now that they can, they can get their diabetes under control, they can get um, preventative care, make sure that they're not developing cancer or heart disease. A woman who has not been going to a doctor of any kind, she'd found out that she had diabetes, but because she didn't have any insurance, she hasn't treated it, she hasn't done anything about it. When I got her here in the clinic, we tested her blood sugar levels and they were off the charts, dangerously high. And we were able to get her started on a treatment plan that cost her less than two cents a day for her medication. I'm gonna be following up with her every week until we get it under control to make sure that everything's okay. The DPC model is everything that I've been looking for. I have wanted to be transparent and be able to tell my patients, this is how much it's gonna cost you. Yes, we can get you in soon. Yes, I want to tell them yes for everything. And this DPC model finally offers me the opportunity to do that for my patients. 
I recently had an opportunity to speak to first year and second year medical students at our health fair. And it was so eye-opening to me to see these, these new students that they have no idea what they're getting themselves into down the road. They have no idea about coding and billing and how much the insurance rules their life. They were actually engaged in what I was saying because they think it's a very interesting and new idea to them because it's not being shared in the medical um, education world. For me, what makes it worth it is this relationship that I get with a patient that I never would have had in any other kind of a, a patient care model. I was learning a lot from these doctors and getting a whole new perspective on our healthcare system. But the true test is how patients feel about this model and the freedom they are experiencing by not having to wait for approvals by insurance companies and having ready access to a doctor. What led me to ARC Family Practice was the ease and the necessity of it. I needed to go to rehab and get some things done after my back surgery and through my insurance there were long waiting periods and then when we figured out let's go ahead and try a steroid shot I went to my doctor and I asked okay is this a possibility and they said yes however we need to get approval from your insurance company well then we have to schedule the appointment and I said okay what's the cash cost and the doctor said uh, it's around a hundred dollars and I went done and then he said well you have to pay the facility too because I had just heard of ARC and so that was on my mind and I thought you know what I'm gonna give them a call and we talked about it they saw my MRIs and they did it right there I didn't have to go through the frustrating rigmarole and waiting period that I would have had to through the typical medical and insurance world. The steroid shot was less than $50 because one thing that ARC really focuses on is the patient and the well-being of the patient, both, both mentally and physically. And you shouldn't have to wait for somebody sitting in their office in some other state that knows nothing about you or your condition saying, stamp it okay. I've even told my other friends that are physicians about it because they are as frustrated with the medical care system and the insurance system as the patients are. So with ARC, it's nice because I can then as a member, they have a list of people that I could go to if I need that physical therapist. They've already talked to them about what are you willing to charge cash price? And that's an easy conversation, and it's usually better than what you would get through the insurance anyway because of that convoluted negotiation process that you're not part of. So that's one of the things I love about ARC and the direct primary care is the connections and the fact that you can pay the cash and it's often more affordable than what you might think because we've been brainwashed yeah. by the ridiculous prices of insurance. I think the direct primary care concept is brilliant. It is so nice to have the direct connection between doctor and patient. So you pay them a monthly fee and you can see them as little or as, uh, as often as you would like. We went in and when we met them and were able to sit down and talk to them, we were completely sold. So to call the ARC and actually speak to a doctor on the phone and ask them about their practice and then ask them if they could see our son and then saying, yes, come on in, let's, let's, we'll, we'll be happy to meet with you and see what we can do to help. It was a sense of relief. One of my children gets sick and I send a text and I say, hey, Dr. Kirby, um, Isabella's not feeling well. She's complaining of a sore throat. She's got kind of a cough and she's had a slight low grade fever. She ended up having strep throat and he said, okay, I can dispense the prescription here for amoxicillin and I asked him of course how much is that going to cost to fill and it was 75 cents. When we first went on to the website to see kind of what the pricing was like we didn't I don't think we be believed it at first it, it's ten dollars per month per kid which is which is ridiculous it's you know you don't have to pay each time each uh, there's no copay you don't have to pay something to go see the doctor anything in any extra you go once, you go zero, you go 10 times for the month. It's 10 bucks for the kid. As a mom of three young kids, it is such a relief to be able to walk out of the doctor's office with the prescription in hand and not have to think about dropping the prescription off, waiting an hour, coming back to pick the prescription up, not knowing what it's gonna cost me and kind of just all of the unknowns, whereas leaving the doctor with amoxicillin, a Z-Pack, Flonase, 
whatever is needed at that time, it's, it's, a, it's a sense of relief to not have to think about what else I'm going to have to do. It's really nice to know that I'm spending $300 a month on Christian Healthcare Ministries and I'm spending between 80 and 90 depending upon if we needed any prescriptions in the month to Ark Family Health. So it's very comforting total to know that our, our medical bills are about $400 a month. With your day-to-day -day medical needs covered, the next piece of healthcare to unmask is surgery. How do you control surgical costs in our current healthcare model? Once again, the answer is quite simple. You can start by posting the cost of surgeries on your website and eliminating insurance companies, like the Surgery Center of Oklahoma has done. We were driven to open uh, our facility because we thought we could do better. We thought we could deliver very high quality care at a reasonable price and not bankrupt patients just because they were sick. We have seven operating rooms here. It's owned and operated by all of the physicians who work here. There is no outside corporate profit seeker. Uh, we don't have an administrator, you're looking at him. All of our employees are multitasking. My head nurse is also the director of HR. So we, we have a very administrative, lean sort of facility, and we're here and designed this facility to take care of patients the way that we would want to be taken care of if, if we were in their shoes. We uh, have seen as many as 8,000 patients in one year. It ranges from year to year as the different insurance companies become more and more aggressive trying to keep their beneficiaries, so-called beneficiaries, out of our facility. But as the deductibles for insurance companies have gone through the roof, more and more patients, even the ones that have insurance, have found they have a better out-of-pocket experience to actually buy their surgery completely out of their pocket here. We publish the prices for all of our procedures uh, on our website. I see our website as a way to instruct people and know really this is perhaps what you should be paying or in this range, but it's also to help people that are, that are looking for a solution even if it's not here at our facility. We've changed the prices four times since we launched the website and in each case have lowered them. I just thought, you know, let's put our prices out there so that the people that actually have the sticker shock who buy health care, the uninsured, high deductible, beneficiaries of self-funded plans, they can better find us. That was part of the idea. The other idea was we really wanted to start a price war because we knew from experience that the prices we were charging people here at our facility were one-sixth to one-tenth what the so-called not-for-profit hospital charged for the same procedure. The more common question is to the big price gouging hospitals, why are they charging ten times what we are? But the simple answer to the question is that we're not greedy. We've decided that in control of the facility, we will charge a fair amount with a small marginal profit and that the physicians and surgeons doing the work will be paid a fair fee. The most gigantic source of price gouging uh, in the surgical uh, business in the United States comes from the hospitals and the institutions. And since we own and control this facility, we have decided that we are gonna be fair with patients uh, from the institutional side as well as from the professional billing side. If a patient comes in from Wisconsin or Alaska or Canada and they want to purchase a gallbladder surgery, they already know the price, they pay us, and there is no paperwork. Uh, for, the, for the benefit of beneficiaries that work for self-funded companies, we send a one-page invoice out uh, by email and receive payment in 30 days. As a facility, we run this like a general contractor with time and materials. We have a pretty good feel for what it actually costs to run an operating room for 15 or 30 minute or hour increments. And then we know what the cost of the supplies and materials are necessary to perform any given case. So it's not even algebra, it's just simple math. I mean, you add those things up and you end up with a price and, and that's what we posted online and we have made very few, shockingly few changes. 
places like Oklahoma Surgery Center or other physician-owned surgery centers are great because they're also looking for cash pay patients, patients who are engaged around their care. And so we're constantly on the lookout for providers, doctors, hospitals who are concerned about having a direct relationship with their patients. And we find that those work together very copacetically with our members because those members that are paying their own bills are going to be a little less aloof, a little more engaged around their healthcare decisions and going to be looking for direct pay options like surgery centers and direct primary care. I actually encourage patients to, you know, look at our pricing and then go to their local hospital and use that to leverage a deal so they don't have to travel. There's some patients that will leverage their local hospital, the local hospital will match our pricing then the patients are kind of disgusted uh, you know, that about the whole process and they'll travel here anyway and relay those kind of stories to me. We have seen patients at our facility from all 50 states except Hawaii. Uh, the first patients that arrived came here from Canada. Uh, you know, they, they all have coverage in Canada, but many of them do not have access to the care that they require. Uh, the most common story from a Canadian is still a, a, a woman who wants a hysterectomy who's tired of receiving transfusions, but who's waiting in a, a line that's two or three years long to, to receive that procedure. A third of the patients that come to our facility are uninsured. A third of the patients that either have health savings accounts or have very high deductibles and they can buy their surgery here uh, with a better out-of-pocket experience. And then the other third are beneficiaries of self-funded plans. So companies that buy healthcare for their employees out of operational revenue rather than participate in the insurance scam. When we opened the facility in 1997, no insurance companies would work with us. And so really all we've ever known is not dealing with insurance companies. We've had a brief arrangement with two or three ins insurance companies over the years but we found that dealing with them was a hassle. Uh, there was a lot of risk involved when they said they would pay and they didn't. Uh, they were always the determinants of what our fees should be. And they were always wrong. They were either too high or too low. And they also they were bullies. From the very beginning, uh, we sustained attacks from what I call the cartel. You know, the, the cabal of the, you know, paid off legislators and the hospital systems and the insurance companies. And the good guys saw us as the underdog, you know, the champion, the friend of the poor and the uninsured, because we would actually put a reasonable price on a procedure rather than bankrupt someone. The Surgery Center of Oklahoma story really is a good news message. There are a lot of people that see it as a good news message, particularly patients. Uh, the buyers of healthcare, the folks, the self-funded companies that see, see pricing that won't bankrupt them, I mean, they, they see this as good news message. Uh, Oklahoma County is the largest county in Oklahoma. They are a client of the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. They buy surgery here for the benefit of their employees. And they waive all of their out-of-pocket if they will come here because their self-funded plan reaps such a benefit. Almost every uninsured patient that comes to the Surgery Center of Oklahoma tells us that the care they receive here was otherwise unaffordable anywhere else that they looked. That, that is the story almost without exception. When people ask what about the poor, you know, like the big hospitals are taking care of them, no, they've run many of them off and they come to our facility and that's the beauty of the market. The market drives prices down, and it drives prices down to a level that people who you would otherwise think as poor can actually afford to buy surgeries here. The good news story around Christmas time when we'll have patients come here and say, you know, we're gonna have Christmas this year because we didn't have to meet our deductible to buy our child's tonsillectomy, not that we could afford our deductible anyway. And these are just great news stories to be eye to eye with patients and, and know really that we're not just their medical advocate, we're also their financial advocate. And so pa patients appreciate that, they need a guiding hand over over this treacherous road that's healthcare in the United States. And I think the free market 
is providing is really providing an answer to those, particularly those that are truly in need. Cash-based surgery centers are a lifeline to many people, but what if we could prevent some medical problems before they begin and control others before they get worse? By educating people about good health and healthy lifestyles, we can. Dr. Sethi and his wife, Maya, founded Healthy Tennessee with the goal of doing just that. Healthy Tennessee's band of volunteers travel across the state, one community at a time, holding preventative screening fairs as well as statewide symposiums. They get in front of patients who haven't seen a doctor in years and offer patient-specific suggestions for better health outcomes. The main goal of Healthy Tennessee is really to educate citizens about the benefits of a healthy lifestyle using their own data. Because right now we just wait till someone's diabetic, till someone's morbidly obese, and then we start talking about these issues. And I think that's just frankly crazy. That's, you know, Washington politician driven programming. We are a boots on the ground organization. We are less talk, more action, we're low budget. Everything that we do is based on empowering local communities. We start by talking to the local state representatives, the, the county mayor, the city mayor, the superintendent of the schools, the chamber of commerce, local business leaders. And I think what we have shown is that by relying on the power of local citizens and local communities across Tennessee, you can do incredible things. What do you need? What's the best way to do this? I would say the majority of folks that we see are people who are just struggling to make ends meet. They cannot afford uh, the, the rising cost of health care insurance, and they need help. Today we've seen about three, 300 ish people so far. We partnered with United Healthcare and Second Harvest Food Bank, and so we had a, uh, a large influx of people in the first hour, uh, but we've got about 50 nurses, doctors on the ground, screening patients, educating them about the benefits of living a healthy lifestyle. This morning we were doing uh, basic checkups, uh, blood pressure, cardio exams, pulmonary exams, trying to do things that we can do here, give them a better perspective on their health right now, and try to give them also some tips to do better by themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. These are people that don't have the opportunities to make it to the physician's office or to the hospitals, and this is their way of getting their screenings and being able to be referred to other people that can help them. This area is actually an area we consider a vulnerable population. It's a population that has low access to health care and health care providers. And once you get out into the rural population, it, you can see the disparity drop just by the access to health care and the access to affordable health care. So it's always great to come out uh, especially with Dr. Manny and volunteer your time just to take the time and tell these people, you know I do care about you and there are opportunities to get in front of a doctor at no cost. The good thing about uh, these young people that have come in and volunteered, uh, you know, going to different schools around the state and Doc Manny and his team is that they take the time, they learn the stories, they learn who they are. This doesn't happen anymore in our health care, you know, uh, system. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's uh, part of the reason we're in the situation we are today. You know, there are some very powerful stories. We saw a nine-year-old girl about five or six years ago when we had a fair here in Nashville, who her mom brought her to us and she was complaining of vision problems and they found a large uh, tumor in her eye that they were able to remove uh, that saved her life. So we are taking care of a lot of uninsured folks and we're trying to take care of them in a different way. And you know, for example, let's say we take your, your blood pressure and it's you know, 170 over 100, which is very high. And you know, you're, if you're overweight and your blood sugars are high, instead of just talking about what medications you should be on, you will spend an hour with a physician or a nurse or an advanced practice nurse talking about, look, here are five ways that you could change your lifestyle right now to tackle some of this. And that's where the magic happens. That's where the counseling occurs. I think the more we do this, every community needs something like this to help raise awareness of, of healthy living. And uh, you know, this is a great service. And anytime you offer free service like this, it brings people out. It's, it's raising awareness and making people understand that you can take control of your own health. And so if you build it from a grassroots standpoint up, then I think you know that's our model. And that can be done in Tennessee, it can be done in Alabama, it can be done in California. Because we're able to reach patients that just won't come to a doctor's office, that are scared of doing that, but they'll come to a community event where there's music and it's a festive environment. 
They can get in and out easily, and we have a method of tracking those folks and following them. And I think that you know a lot of these insurance companies are starting to see the benefit uh, of our model. One interesting thing that we're working on right now is developing a system of health coaches everywhere we go to follow up with those patients that want follow up. We reach out to local nursing schools there, um, to the medical schools in Nashville, and we have different doctors, nurses, nursing students, dentists, dental students. They just people just come. Because here's the thing: if people want to help, this is what this is one major thing I have learned over the last couple of years of doing this is that if you offer people an opportunity to make a difference, they will take it in a heartbeat. Healthy Tennessee is a concept that should be spread across the country. And as I've discovered, venturing outside the box of traditional healthcare works for more than just doctors and surgeons, chiropractors, testing laboratories, physical therapists, and pharmacists are all getting on board and they are welcome additions. We need to look at providing lots of solutions. The more choices people have, the more freedom they have to choose what they want for their health care, the better off we'll all be. We see that in every other industry. The more choices you have, the more price goes down and the more quality goes up. I have started going to a physical therapist because I had surgery, so you need to go through rehab. And I have told her about it and she loves the concept. So I hooked her up with our family practice then my physical therapist is also connected to a pharmacist that has a compounding pharmacy. And they're frustrated with everything that's going on as well. And so we're starting to make these touches and these contacts and getting the ideas out there that there are other options. We started getting into the cash pay world and we recognized that the insurance deductibles were much higher and it was creating a problem with some of the patients not wanting to come in because of the deductibles and everything that they were experiencing. So we went to a cash pay pricing system that we have so it's a huge discount patients are able to come in they get more time with the physical therapist even if you have insurance you can still use cash to come in because um, you'll see that a lot of times you'll get better care and so you may have insurance but the cash pay allows us as clinicians to freestyle a little bit more if that's what you want to call it allows the patient to get better care we recognize how many employees it takes for us to actually deal with insurance companies and oftentimes what will happen is we do the billing and you know a lot of extensive note taking that then we can put the billing onto it goes to our billing person who then sends it to the billing department the billing department then has to send it out to get payment from the insurance company insurance company you know accepts rejects it whatever through the billing department they take a percentage of it and then it comes back to us and then we have to see if some of the billing wasn't done then that then we have to look at why resubmit it whatever we have to do so the amount that we get paid is so inconsistent but it's just all over the board so um, you'll have the same patient come in for three visits with the same care three back-to-back -back visits and we'll get totally different payments for, I mean we're talking like $44 to $200 it's not even within a range so it's very hard as a business to predict how much you're gonna get paid it's very hard as a business to predict you know what what the average payment is per patient it's very hard to make a lot of predictions because the the varying pay that we get from different insurances so with our cash pay patients it's awesome because we know every single time what we're getting paid we know if they're in a certain package how much we're getting per visit and therefore we can say that one therapist can see you know six patients in a day cash pay versus with the insurance we're not sure how many patients need to be seen it's immediate payment it's in the bank and it's you know less stress overall on the business often compounding isn't covered by the insurance payer so patients will come in and we will offer them a um, patient preferred price we call it a cash price for the medication that we have made for them I've built a lot of my business around the concierge um, market in here in Phoenix and Scottsdale. There's a lot of providers that have patients that they see in their homes, patients that they see, you know, alternate site. It isn't a traditional primary care model where they go in and they sit in the waiting room. It's very much health care brought to the patient. And um, we will then build medications and things that doctors like to use, and they will deliver them to the home. I had a patient we worked with on Thursday. She's like, I have a terrible sensitivity to lactose, Sarah. Could you compound my, and, and see how I do on it? And she did beautifully. It was surprised me, just that little bit of lactose in the commercial tablets, she couldn't tolerate. She says, I, can, I feel different on compounding, and it was a slightly different dose. We found something kind of in between, and it's almost like we dial it in just 
to them. But, you know, dialed in for you is, is really great. And you can find kind of where your sweet spot and where you feel the best. Dialed in just for you is what direct pay healthcare is all about. It's all about the patient. And patients need to be getting maximum value for their health care. There are two economic models of health care. legislator's pen. And once again, Dr. Smith is right. When I started this journey, I was looking for a solution from the government, a solution that just isn't there. While everyone argues over single payer versus private insurance, real people are stuck in the middle. And these are all ideas people can do right now. My quest for finding more affordable coverage for a major medical incident led me away from the government. It led me to a more compassionate place, one where community reaches out to share your costs, where paying cash for care allows you the freedom to choose the care you want and need. I'm no longer tied to insurance mandates of what I can and can't do. I can negotiate my own prices for care, and because I'm directly responsible for pain, I feel more of a responsibility to take care of myself. Take a look at your own healthcare situation. Are you tired of waiting for hours in a doctor's office to then only see the doctor for five minutes? Isn't your time more valuable than that? Is your deductible so high you can't afford surgery? Are you going without insurance because you simply can't afford it, even if your employer does provide it? Are you a small business owner who wants to provide benefits to your employees? Do you know if your prescription might be cheaper if you simply paid the cash price? When I dropped my insurance, my monthly premium had skyrocketed to $809 a month. Today, I would be paying $1,037 a month just for me with a high deductible. That's insane and no one should be paying that. I actually pay less for my prescription by paying cash than what I had been paying with insurance. That had never even occurred to me. I saved $10,000 last year by not having insurance and yet, I was covered for any major medical incident. I got my annual physical exam and I kept taking my prescription. My health care didn't suffer because I didn't have traditional health insurance. In fact, I'm probably healthier because I'm not under so much stress, worrying about the monthly cost, and I'm more engaged in my care. I was fed up with the system, just like millions of others. I took a step back and discovered that cash really is king.